question is the settler movement. So think of the settler movement as at least ideological mirror of the Palestinians who claim all the land. So if you ask, what is the Palestinian claim to all the land? They'll come up with their claims. And the settlers claim a mirror image. So if one is going to fault the settlers for claiming all the land, fault Palestinians for claiming all the land. The main difference, of course, is a few for, except for a few outbreaks of violence, the settlers have not engaged in genocide and atrocities, although they have the power to do so. Now, people have, bought, have brought up uh, settler violence against... For, for, hold on a second, I have an echo in here. Someone turns their mic off? Okay, thank you. Uh, against the uh, Palestinian village of Huwara. Look at it from their side. When we object to the massacre of all the families on the, uh, on the, uh, near the Gaza border, there was a family massacred in the past year uh, in a car, a mother and her two daughters. Before that, another father and children. Uh, remember Mayor Kahana? His son who lived on the West Bank? Uh, he and I think four of his children were slaughtered back in 2000. If you look at the history of anti-settler violence, it's one family at a time, one slaughtered family at a time. Finally, in my mind, and again, I'm not saying I agree with this, but the settler said, you're not the only ones who are capable of violence. If this city of Horara is going to assassinate any Jew who drives through your town, if you're going to send out terrorist squads and attack Jews in their cars and murder families, we're going to go in there and we're going to burn your cars. You notice there wasn't, although they had the power to, there wasn't a mass murder in Harawa. There were some burnt cars, and there was maybe a few persons killed here or there. But the settlers have had enough of the idea that the violence is one way. So they're pushing back. Now, what you have here again is something of a civil war on the West Bank be, uh, with a dispute over the land. Now, I have, I have been intrinsically against expanding settlements until what I've seen is I've talked to people, they said they've never actually said peace. The minute they would have said peace, settlements would have stopped. But notice what they're doing. They keep dangling peace, so we stop settlements, but they never actually sign the peace. And the settlers say, when you sign peace, when you demilitarize, when you take out the goal to murder Jews, we'll talk about settlements. But until then, it's our land. You say it's your land, we say it's our land. We're just going to call this even. See, it goes from here. So if anybody says settler violence, you can say, well, what about Palestinian violence? It's, uh, it's against the settlers. Oh, excuse me. There wasn't uh, violence against Israelis inside the Greenland before 1967. There weren't raids from Gaza murdering people in the same kibbutzim and settlements today. They were being murdered then. I just found a, 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 a eulogy given by Moshe Dayan in 1956 for people murdered at, at precisely one of the settlements that was taken over by Hamas where they murdered dozens of people. The murder of people across the border was going on, which is one reason why Israel conducted the 1956 uh, incursion into Egypt. Which part of that was to stop the terrorism from the Gaza Strip. So if they say the terrorism began with the settler movement, that's an outright lie. The terrorism was going on from 1948 until 1967. And remember, you have to, you'll have to think, how many, how many terrorist strikes have been inside of Israel? Passover Seder massacre, the taking over a bus where the bus drivers were massacred, the taking over a school inside of Israel where the school children were massacred. Look up the history of terror strikes uh, by, by um, Palestinian terrorists. It hasn't been on the West Bank. It's been inside of Israel. So if they say it's the settlers, say, well, if it's the settlers, if it's the occupation, quote-unquote, why are you massacring Israel's inside the Green Line? Why? Because they claim all of it is theirs. So the settlers are contesting their narrative. Right? Now, I didn't like it until I talked to a few of them, and they said, why should they be able to go out and kill one person at a time, one family at a time, two soldiers at a time, a mother at a time, her three daughters at a time. Why are we tolerating this? We're going to take the fight to them. I don't like it, but it's the reality. There's a war on. And, this, and the uh, Israelis on the West Bank, 
they are not granting this because even if every settler moved off, off the West Bank, there'd still be war, except it'd be war right next to Israeli population centers. So it, it's tough. But if anybody claims settlers, look at your history. It's not settlers. It was before settlers. It's around settlers. All the settlers are doing is saying, we're not going to stand here like, uh, like, like sheep going to the slaughter. You attack us, we'll attack you. However, if you look at the, the people, anybody killed by settlers, it's minuscule. Most of the Palestinians who have been killed have been killed by the Israeli army, protecting uh, Jews and going into terror cells. Uh, so it, 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 it's not as simple as the other side want, wants to say it. We have to master these facts. So if anybody says anything, first thing is, A, it's a war. Israel fighting for her survival. If you want to claim all the land, then Israel will claim all the land. We'll call it a disputed land, and now we're going to go to war. Quit this false piety of it's settlers, it's our land. I don't think we should grant that. I used to think that. I, I'm repenting. I don't want to grant that anymore. It's disputed land until they sign a peace deal. Until then, it's disputed land. It's my point of view. It's a strong point of view, but I'm not granting this to the other side anymore after what happened on, on October 7th. What do they want? Is it inside the, inside the state of Israel? Do they want air villages dismantled? Forced integration? When they say apartheid, one reason there has been no cultural genocide is that Arab villages get to keep their language, get to keep their schools, and no one makes them stay. As I said last time, anybody can live anywhere they want in the state of Israel. There's no forced segregation. Um, in the neighborhood where we have an apartment in Israel, it is completely mixed of, of several nationalities, including Sudanese, um, uh, Eritreans, Ethiopians, Palestinians, Turks. They all live there. There's no apartheid. You go down to the beach in Israel, most of the shops owned on the beach are run by Arabs and Palestinians because they want to stay open for tourists. So Jews don't want to be there. They might want to keep Shabbat. If you go up and down the Strand in Tel Aviv, the markets are owned by Palestinians. The markets that we frequented, there were people who spoke Arabic. They were Palestinian. I'll call Israeli Arabs or Palestinian. Women in hijabs. Uh, go on the buses in Israel. Uh, so inside Israel... It's just a ridiculous argument. If they say there's apartheid, say, show me. Show me any Israeli law that forbids an Arab to go from one place to the next. They're using the image of South Africa, right? They're taking a word and they're putting it on Israel, and it has no application other than throwing out a word to delegitimize Israel. Now, there is a fact that Israelis, Israeli Jews and Arabs do live apart, but that's by choice. Arab villages want to stay Arab villages. They don't want to be forcibly integrated into Israeli society. They want to keep their culture, keep their schools, keep their language, which they should. So the fact that Israel does not forcibly integrate Arabs is not apartheid. It's called respect for other people's culture. So if anybody says apartheid, you have to say, what exactly do you mean? Then they will say, well, there's a wall. My response is, well, first of all, doesn't the other side want their own state? Doesn't that mean there's going to be a border eventually? So how can you both want your own state and claim apartheid, let's say, on the West Bank? That's one thing. Secondly, the walls were built to stop uh, snipers. Look at the history of the walls, because there were snipers sniping into Israeli settlements. And if a person says apartheid, say, what are the Arabs after on the West Bank, if not their own state with their own borders? They want apartheid. Just say it. They are the ones who want their own state behind their own borders, which means they want to live apart. Apartheid means apartness. So it's a ridiculous claim. The Arabs want to live apart. Palestine wants its own state. So how can Israel be accused of apartheid? So I'm going to ask you, what do they mean when they say Israel is an apartheid state? Do you have any idea what they mean? Um, um, it's, it's a true question. Does anybody know what they mean? I have no idea what they mean. Do they mean there's inequity? Sure. Yeah, there's, there's amelioration to take place. Uh, is there a higher crime in Arab uh, towns than Israeli? Yes. Um, are, are, uh, is, the, is the wealth of the state evenly distributed? P 
probably not. That's not apartheid. That, that's part of a society and a culture where there are inequities. So if one were to say, there are inequities in Israeli society and culture, I'll say, okay, well, let's work on it, which is a far cry from apartheid. You see what I'm saying? So when a person brings up to me inequities, I say, well, then call it inequities. Don't call it apartheid. So what they do is they take something called inequity, they use a different word in order to delegitimize the state of Israel. So I'll always ask people exactly what they mean and what their evidence is. Now, I almost uh, one person said to me, there are Jewish roads on the West Bank that, that uh, Palestinians can't drive on. Some areas are, truly are restricted to Palestine, and Israelis can't go in there without permission. And some areas, Palestinians can't go into certain Israeli areas. Yeah, that's called a border. That's called trying to create a Palestinian state. So when everybody, whenever anybody says something, ask them for a detail and look up the background. I guarantee you, Israel's not an apartheid state inside the state of Israel. On the West Bank, it's problematic because of the attempt to separate the populations, which is the will of Palestinians. They want their own state. They want to be segregated from the Israelis. You can't have it both ways. You can't say both, we want to have our own country, and then create separation, and then accuse the other side of wanting separation. I think both sides actually want to be separated from each other. Neither one is apartheid. I think each one wants their own peoples to live relatively separate from the others. But I want to emphasize, in the state of Israel, anybody can live anywhere they want. Anybody can work anywhere they want. There's a large number of, of Arabs in the Israeli uh, medical system. Disproportionate number of Israeli physicians are Arabs. They're in every company in Israel. When our daughter studied at the uh, at Herzliya, the IDC, many of the students in her school were Palestinian, were Arabs. It just doesn't exist. So if any says, anybody says apartheid, ask them where, when, exactly what, and you'll find it's just a, it, it, it's a uh, preposterous uh, statement. Colony means an empire has sent colonists. That's actually not true, obviously correct. Meaning Jews were refugees from Russia. They weren't colonists sent by Russia. Um, the idea is that, is that we all understand that, correct? So the word colony is just is just misused. Yes, did the, did the British Empire send colonies to North America? That's happened throughout world history. Look at the uh, look at the um, uh, the Adriatic Sea. Look at their Greek colonies all up and down and around the Mediterranean. There are Roman colonies throughout. Uh, look at look at the Arab empires. They're sending colonists all over the, uh, the the dozens of countries that they conquered. So the idea of an empire sending its people to live in another land that's a, that's a, that's ancient history. Uh, did Native Americans do this? Were Native Americans completely peace loving people and never invaded or, or had war on each other? So we have this mythologizing that the war has never had migration. There's never been wars over land until 1948. So when they say colonists, say colony meaning people sent from what country? They say, okay, they weren't colonists. They were settlers. We call that immigration. We call it migration. Is that still going on? Has that happened all through world history? So if somebody makes a claim, you have to say, what exactly is the claim? And when you find out what they typically mean is migration. So when you look at the, let's say, the, the Arab population in Palestine up to 1948, they were anti-immigrant. It's an anti-immigrant society. Now, when I mentioned that to somebody, I said, look, there's a lot of Americans who are anti-immigration because they feel that immigrants are going to gnaw away at um, you know, familiar white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant culture. And they don't want somebody messing that up. And Palestinians felt the same way. They, they, they didn't want people with a different religion, a different ethnicity living in their land. They said, well, you can't, it's not the same thing. I said, how is it not the same thing? Right? They were anti-immigrant. Now, they didn't control the land. The British controlled the land. And the British said, as long as they're not taking your land, you know, we're going to allow Jewish immigration until they stopped in 1936. So I can offer a lot more, but don't grant the word colonist. Don't grant the word illegal occupation, settler. That's actually not what happened. Um, so you look it up, be firm. When they say colonists, say it's not a colony. Well, what is it? It's called migration.
is what it's called. That has happened throughout world history. Top Hamas leadership is in um, the UAE, it's in Qatar, it's in Beirut. That, that's true. And the, the main thing is to defeat the Hamas military infrastructure in Gaza. I don't know how they're going to do it. I have my theories, you have yours. Actually, what they're doing now, which is brief incursions and pulling back, I actually think is brilliant because they're keeping the enemy off guard. You come in from the sea, come from the air, come from the land, pull back. It's like throwing jabs in a boxing, boxing match. I don't know how this is going to be resolved. I just hope they get to the point where the Hamas infrastructure is destroyed and that some group, I don't know who's going to be, the Egyptians, the Saudi Arabians, realize it's not in their interest for an ISIS-like group to exist in the Arab world because all it does is spread death and destruction. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen, but here's one thing we do know. The destruction of ISIS was welcomed in the Arab world. And we, the United States, had a strong uh, influence on the destruction of ISIS, especially allied with the Kurds. Who stood up to ISIS? The Kurds and the Americans, and eventually the Iraqi army got their got got going on it. But prior to that, the, the Iraqi army was almost destroyed by ISIS. They were on their way to Baghdad because, in my mind, we, in a very inconsiderate way, pulled our troops out of Iraq when we should not have. We should have left a division up in northwestern Iraq, away from everybody, because of the instability in the region. Now, uh, uh, tens of thousands at least, Arabs died, Kurds died, Christians died, because America wasn't there. As soon as America came back, by the way, in a surgical way, ISIS was destroyed. So I see Hamas as ISIS. I see Hamas as Daesh. If you ever describe Hamas, say Hamas ISIS, because it's the same tactics. How's it going to be destroyed? It might like, be like the Battle of Mosul was the last stronghold of ISIS. Study the Battle of Mosul. It was a bitter struggle. Um, it was uh, house, house fighting, going underground. Um, if, if you want an analogy, you can look at some of the battles in the Second World War uh, on Iwo Jima, for example, where the Japanese had dug in into mountainsides, four stories of, uh, of bunkers um, filled with provisions. And what the Marines went through to take uh, Iwo Jima, is, it was unspeakably brutal, but we had to do it. I mean, I, I just recently read another history of Iwo Jima because of this. It was unspeakably brutal, but Japan had to be defeated. Now, the question is, um, is Israel willing to take the casualties to defeat ISIS? Because Israel has been very, very careful about taking casualties. Um, uh, as you know, the morale of Israeli soldiers is incredibly high. In my opinion, Israeli pilots are keeping pictures in their cockpit on the atrocity, atrocities of October 7th. Israeli soldiers, in my opinion, are putting those pictures up inside their tanks. They're putting up inside their tents. So the question is, will Israel absorb 2,000 deaths? 5,000 deaths? Which has never happened in an Israeli war. Will Israel absorb it? Or allow Hamas to continue to exist and do this again 10 years, 20 years from now? Israel has never been in a place like this since 1948. This is the continuation of the 1948. It's not like the 1967 war, uh, where the enemy pulled back. It's not like the Yom Kippur War, which is fought to a standstill in Egypt and Syria. This is a war where you have to win the war or they're just going to do it again. So can Israel defeat Hamas? Yes. Will they have to take extraordinarily high casualties? Yes. Are Israeli soldiers willing to pay the price from everything that I can detect? Yes. They want to defeat Hamas. This is going to be a war that's going to have echoes for the next two generations. I, like many of you, wish I could be there. I wish I could be there and do my part. We're going to do our part here. All of the historians agree that the Israeli preemptive strike against Egypt was entirely justified by the laws of war, which means they were amassing troops and tanks on the Israeli border, threatening war over and over again. The newsreels coming out of Egypt where we're going to destroy Israel 
We're going to create mountains of schools on the beach. We're going to march up to Tel Aviv. We're going to take over Eilat. We're going to slice right into Israel through the Negev and spread the other country and, and, and bring death and destruction everywhere they went. This is not a secret. You can go back to the newsreels of 1967. So Israel had a choice to make. Allow them to attack and get deep into Israeli territory or preemptively strike. Now, as far as the West Bank, Jordan began shelling Israel. They sent fighter airplanes over to attack Israel. And Israel begged the Jordanians not to get involved. You can look at the record. And the Jordanians would not stop the shelling and the airstrikes, and Israel went in. That was a provoked war. On the northern border, the entire war, the Syrians never stopped shelling northern Israeli settlements inside of Israel. So they kept bombing, kept bombing, kept bombing while the fighting was going on in the Sinai and on the West Bank. And the Israels in the north were saying, you have to protect us. There were some kibbutzim that were demolished by Syrian artillery, one after the other. They were living underground. And they were, they, were, they were sending messages down to Tel Aviv saying, you have to save us. They're destroying us here. Israel warned the Syrians to stop. And they said, you, you have to stop. And the Syrians believed that they had the Soviets behind them, that Israel never tried to invade the uh, Golan Heights and, and take the casualties that would be inevitable. And finally, Israel said, okay, we're going to silence Syrian artillery once and for all, that they have been doing since 1948. So if you look at the laws of war, the, the preemptive strike on, 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 on Egypt was entirely justified. The strike on Jordan was because of provocation, and the strike on Syria was because of provocation. But remember, right after the war, Israel said, we'll, we'll trade land for peace. It was not a war of conquest, it was a war of self-defense. The other side refused peace. What happened when uh, Sadat wanted peace? He got the entire Sinai back. All they had to do was say the word peace. Look at Michael Oren's book on the 1967 war. I mean, it, it is outlined in excruciating detail. Uh, in 1967, there was a, the UN governed the, the border between Israel and Egypt. What did Egypt do? They asked the UN to evacuate so they could attack. So look, the UN was there for a reason to stop this from happening. So if anybody um, doubts the, the permissibility of a preemptive strike against an enemy on your border, who's announced the intention to invade, where they've massed armor and infantry, that there was a, a force, the UN, there in, to prevent such a thing, and they asked them to evacuate so that they could attack. You have to look at the background. So if someone says Israel began, it's called a, a, a preemptive strike completely within the laws of war. So if they want to continue arguing three go-arounds and say, you know what, it was a war, if the Egyptians didn't want a war, they shouldn't have massed several divisions on the Israeli border and threatened war and threatened genocide. They shouldn't have. Okay. So at some point, the person's going to say, well, Israel struck first. Okay, fine. You could have, they could have also not threatened the destruction of the state of Israel. That was also their choice. At a certain point for all of us, after a couple of go-arounds, you can't convince someone who is impervious to reason. So just get out of the argument. Yes, there was a preemptive strike. It was entirely justified. Uh, let me just say a couple more words about the 67 war. Um, in 1956, when there was similar constant provocation against Israel from the Gaza border, and Israel kept warning them, uh, in addition, the British and French wanted the Suez Canal back. So the British, French, and the Israelis, they, they uh, planned this Israeli strike into Egypt. What happened to the Egyptian army that was in the Sinai Desert ready to fight the Israelis? The Egyptian chief of staff called a general retreat. They never fought. Israel didn't win the 1956 war. The Egyptians chose not to fight it. You can read about this. They got themselves back to the canal, went across the canal, and then went to the UN and, and called for a ceasefire, which the UN granted and made Israel pull out. Okay, that was their strategy in 1967. Most people don't know this. 
When Israel struck in 1967, that same chief of staff, who was still in head of the Egyptian army, Amer, A-M-E-R, he said, I know what to do. Run for the canal and call for a ceasefire. That's exactly what they did. Israel did not win the Six Days War as much as the Egyptians chose not to fight. Now, there, weren't, there, there were very bloody battles uh, near Rafiach and El Arish. I don't want to minimize the horrible battles that took place in the Sinai, but at a certain point, the Egyptian chief of staff called for a general retreat. I mean, when you read the autobiographies of Egyptian soldiers, it was terrible. They were ready to fight, and they looked up and they realized their officers are gone. Their armor has taken off. So what did Amir think? We'll get across the canal, we'll get to the United Nations, we'll call for a ceasefire, and then we get everything back, and we don't have to lose that many soldiers. Now, this is on the historical record. Israel got to the canal, and they said, ceasefire, Israel pulled back, and Israel said, we're not pulling back without a peace deal. Now, that stunned the world. Israel said, we're not pulling back, and President Johnson supported Israel. When did Israel give back the Sinai Desert to the Egyptians? When Sadat said, peace. They got every inch of it back. Okay? It was not a war of conquest. It was a war for peace. It was a war for peace, not conquest. The minute peace was called, Israel allowed peace, evacuated the few settlements that had put on, been on, put on the border between Egypt and Gaza as protective settlements. Those were evacuated, caused great heartache in Israel at, at the time. Um, and look where we are today. The Egyptians control the Sinai, except that Who's infiltrated into the Sinai? Daesh, ISIS, Hamas. Egypt is having a very tough time controlling their own land because of, of, uh, of terrorism that they're suffering. Um, so uh, I recommend that you read Michael Oren's book, uh, The Six Days War. It's very readable. Um, there, there's critique of the book, but it's a great place to start to understand The Six Days War. I think you're really going to enjoy reading it. There's a great deal of history and what was going on in the Arab countries, um, Arab uh, 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 socialism. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating read to read of the turmoil in the Arab world uh, in the early 1960s. And um, the uh, Egyptians were left with, uh, some people say, and I agree, the war was a decision to avoid the internal struggles in the uh, Arab world at that time. Um, so the more you know, the more you're going to understand why Egypt did what they did, how they lost the war, and the consequences of the war. Boycott, divest, and sanction means to undermine the existence of the state of Israel. The headquarters of BDS is in Ramallah. The, you know, if they say boycott, I choose not to boycott, what, I'm, I'm not ethical? I don't have to boycott, I don't have to divest, and I don't have to sanction Israel. What, what, make, what makes them ethical and me not ethical? I mean, think about it. If someone says boycott Mexico because of the cartels, and you say, I don't want to boycott Mexico, I want, to, you know, I want to help Mexico overcome the cartels, are you unethical? So the claim that BDS is ethical, I would say it, it sounds nonviolent. Okay, I'll grant you. But just because you have a nonviolent approach to undermining Israel doesn't make it ethical, nor am I unethical if I don't want to boycott, divest, and sanction. Look what a ridiculous argument this is. Look at the hubris. Look at the smugness. A person who says, I want to destroy Israel in nonviolent ways. I'm not going to grant that. And, and, you know, in fact, I would say, boycott, I'm going to only buy Israeli goods. Divest, buy Israel bonds. Sanction, no, we're not sanctioning Israel. Sanction Hamas. Sanction Syria. Sanction Iran. Why sanction Israel? Okay, so notice he's taken control of the conversation. He calls their approach ethical, and, and you won't do what we say when we're not, when we're not preaching violence. Why, why do we have to do what they say? For what? When Palestine has its state, let's say, and I really hope there's a, a solution, probably not in my lifetime, but let's say they have a state, and they have a law that says, Anybody in the Palestinian diaspora can come and live in Palestine. Just show that you are of Palestinian lineage. And people say, oh, that's racism. No, they're allowing the settlement of people who are in the Palestinian diaspora. It's not racist. So what if Israel says anybody in the Jewish diaspora has citizenship, it's called racist. Hey, we're not a race. I mean, if you look at Israel, you have, you have, you have 
Russians to Ethiopians living in the country is not racist. It's called a religious heritage. Now, if anybody of another race wants automatic immigration to Israel, just convert and become a Jew. It's not racist. It's religious. So notice they use the word racist when they mean religious. And it's a heritage. And Israel, as a country, has a perfect right to establish an immigration policy for the diaspora, just as I hope the Palestinians do. I hope that everybody in the Palestinian diaspora moves to Palestine. Okay, good for them. Oh, by the way, I want to tell you, when I hear free Palestine, when I hear free, free Palestine, you know what I think? Go, go to Palestine. Go. Go to Gaza. Join up. Live under Hamas. Right? Um, you know, I saw, I saw a, a very nasty cartoon, it, uh, an LGBT person said, I'm going to Palestine to, to establish an LGBT community in, in, you know, in, in Gaza to support. And they said, we haven't heard from the person. Who wants to move to Gaza? Who wants to live under Hamas? What Palestinian in America wants to go back to the homeland and live in the Gaza Strip? Do you see a big movement of people say, I really want to go live in Gaza? So this idea that is racial superiority is called a religious heritage, and I hope the Palestinians do the same thing for their diaspora, right? L let them do it. Good for them. Does Hamas enjoy the support of Gazans? Apparently, yes. Really? Completely. Why? Because remember, these ideological movements, the so-called anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, anti-Zionist, they're not in favor of their local populations. They're rooted in hatred. If you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, when they first came out, I went to their website, pro-Palestinian, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic. Now, they took that one down pretty quickly, but you can still find it. Black Lives Matter was not about, if you look at the money they got, it was not ameliorating the conditions of black people. I never saw any program that they founded, that they founded with their money. It was about hatred of white America. Now, if someone wants to hate white America, it's a free country, hate white America. Uh, but remember, it wasn't, it wasn't rooted in ameliorating conditions in, uh, among black communities. Defund the police, as you know. The most people harmed by that were black communities. So Gazans apparently support Hamas because Hamas hates Israel, and they are willing to suffer great, great um, uh, deprivation in order to destroy Israel. Uh, now, I think the popularity will go down the more the war continues, but you had the same thing in Germany and the same thing in Japan. People didn't like the SS and the Gestapo and the Kempatai, but if you didn't run afoul of the German ideology or Japanese ideology, right, they were winning the war. There's no downside to that. As far as I can tell, the, um, uh, the radical ideologies that, want to, that are anti-Western, want to destroy Israel, kill every Jew, and eventually every American, and, and, and promote an Islamic taker of the world, these are not my words, those are, those are their words, enjoys great popularity in Gaza and in the West Bank. How do we know the West Bank? Abu Mazen is terrified to hold an election because he fears if there's an election held on the West Bank, Hamas will win the election. And that's one reason why it, um, the, Palestine, as it were, the West Bank, is not a democratic society. There's no rule of law. There's no system of justice. There's no uh, uh, democracy because they're afraid of democracy because, remember, when, we, when Israel pulled out of Gaza, they, uh, uh, Hamas ended up taking over. And the West Bank is terrified of that. For complex reasons I don't want to go into today, but one reason they don't want Hamas to take over the West Bank, because it will mean war with Israel. And I think while people on the West Bank hate Israel and would love to see Israel destroyed, the question is, they, do they want to be destroyed when they declare such a war? Now, there are forces on the West Bank that would be glad to have such a war and have Israel uh, conduct a war and then call for a ceasefire and for the delegitimize Israel. But others on the West Bank realize right now, as we speak, um, they woken up a sleeping tiger. Israel was willing to just brush it off, brush it off, brush it off, take a few deaths here, massacre a family here, launch some rockets here. We don't want a war with you guys. The atrocities on October 7th 
have changed the nature of the relationship for a hundred years. You, none of us here will ever, ever sleep at night without thinking about this before you go to sleep. I mean, I watch these videos. I make myself watch them because I, I, I got to remember what's at stake. I don't want to forget what's at stake. Israel, remember, remember we said never forget? Well, we forgot. We actually forgot. And we saw what happened when we forgot. I mean, our daughters are in their 20s. They're never going to forget. This, these are their peers that were massacred at that festival. For a hundred years, we're not going to forget. I don't know what's next, but it's not going to be what was. The enemy is dedicated to the destruction of the state of Israel, the murder of every Jew, by extension, the murder of every American, by extension, these are not my words, these are theirs, bringing all of the world under the domination of Islam. Um, Islam has, has basically two words for the world. One is Dar al-Islam, the world that is under Islam, the meaning the, the so-called religion of peace, and Dar al-Harb, which is the world of the sword. Either you're under Islam or you're subject to the sword. We live in Dar al-Harb, which means the world yet to be su uh, submitted by the sword. That's who you are. You live in Dar al-Harb. If you're not a Muslim living under a Muslim state, you are in Dar al-Harb. And is you can look this up, Dar al-Harb, H-A-R-B. Look it up. It's a religion rooted in world domination. Now, do most Muslims agree with it? No. I, I think maybe 90% don't. 10% is still a lot of people that want to destroy the West. Um, so I, I would like to see that ideology extinguished. I would like to see world peace. But it seems we can only get to world peace through uh, defeating Hamas in this war. So when we use the term, thank you, the term open-air prison, so clearly there's a concept called open-air prison, correct? I mean, there's something called an open-air prison. So there must be one other one to use, a, to use the concept. I mean, there must be something called an open-air prison, and Gaza is an example of it. Is that, are you following my logic? Where is the other open air prison that we're talking about? It doesn't exist. It's a made up term. But it's not a prison in any sense of the term. Go to your Google search and look beautiful Gaza City. Prior to the war that they declared, it was, I, I would, you know, I'm going to say it's like a third world country. I mean, it's, they're, they're, it's filled with cars, filled with shops. There's mosques, there's parks, there's school. They have a marina there. Um, it's poor, but it has its own uh, internet, it has its own telecom system, it has its own medical system. There's nothing there that resembles something controlled by Israel. By the way, it was controlled by Israel. Israel did a very poor job of controlling it, I think we might agree. So the idea, open-air prison, say, well, did they have a free market? Do there, are there shops? Uh, look at the videos. It's filled with cars. You know one thing I noticed? <sighs> it's terrible to say. When they had that slaughtered young woman in the back of a pickup truck, I thought, to, and I looked behind the pickup truck, under the pickup truck, I saw well-paid streets. I saw villas behind the pickup truck. I saw people well-fed. I saw shops. So if, it's, if there's a blockade, if it's an open-air prison, how can there be thousands of pickup trucks that invaded Israel, or at least hundreds? Where'd the machine guns come from? Where are the rockets coming from? If it's controlled by Israel, how could any of this have happened? That, that's obvious, right? There's no, there's no effective blockade for this amount of military equipment and pickup trucks and machine guns and uniforms and clothes and RPGs. They had all of that. Secondly, just look at any video of Gaza that they're not shooting, right, in order to show the destruction. Look at something from a couple of years ago. Look at daily life in Gaza, beautiful Gaza city, um, schools in Gaza, mosques in Gaza. You have to go around the, 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 the control of the conversation. And what you'll find is Gaza was a poor country. Now, why poor? Because Israel made sure that all goods that came into Gaza were offloaded in uh, Ashkelon or Ashdod. I forget which is the most southern port examine, and then shipped into Gaza. There was no blockade. It was called interdiction of goods. Examine, 
shipped into Gaza. Same with the Egyptian border. Goods got across the border. Goods got across the, the southern border. The, uh, is the, kind of the Eras crossing. There was a Kerem Shalom and the Eras. Look up C-O-G-A-T, Kogat. There was a huge administration of transferring civilian goods into Gaza. But what would happen? Hamas destroyed one of the, one of the crossings. Where goods were coming into Gaza, they blew it up. Every time they would declare war on Israel, Israel would start to limit the number of goods. So why was Gaza poor? Because they chose war. When they would back off of war, Gaza would start to flourish more. When they went back to war, Gaza would stop flourishing. It's not a prison. It's a relatively poor country made poor by disastrous policies of continuous warfare. Don't ever forget, the southern border of Gaza is controlled by Egypt, not by Israel. And therefore, if Egypt really wanted, if the Arab world wanted Gaza to prosper in an unlimited way, why doesn't Egypt lift, lift, the, uh, lift their border? Why don't they allow complete transfer of goods into Gaza? Ask yourself, ask anybody else, why does Egypt have a closed border with Gaza? Because it, it's a preposterous idea that Gaza is an outdoor uh, prison. It, it's preposterous. But if so, why doesn't Egypt send in relief? They control their southern border. So it's a preposterous idea. There's no evidence for it. It's just a meme. It's something they throw out that gets into you. And what do you start to feel? Empathy, sympathy, guilt, wrongdoing, amelioration. It plays on the heartstrings. So what is the recipe, for the, the, the antidote to this? Always remember, morality is a reasoning discipline. Morality is activated, activated by sympathy for sure but then pursued with rationality. If someone says wrongdoing, my sympathy is aroused. But then I examine what's happening. And what do I find? It's not wrongdoing on Israel's part. Israel's responding to, a, to a, an enclave that has declared war on Israel. And therefore, Israel and Egypt control the borders. Just try to imagine, Lori, just imagine for a minute. Hamas says, we no longer want to destroy Israel. We're going to become demilitarized. If we demilitarize, there's no chance that Israel wants to come in here and rule a bunch of people for no reason. Try to imagine Hamas be Gaza becomes completely demilitarized and prove it. The borders will open. The marina will be overstocked with people putting, wanting to put boats there. It's actually a beautiful marina. It's a beautiful coastline. If Hamas drops their weapons, Gaza will thrive. The only thing between Gaza and a thriving future is the Hamas decision to go to war. Don't ever forget that. Don't buy into these memes that play on your heartstrings, respond with moral reasoning, and then conclude with this. Drop the intention to destroy the Jewish state and murder every Jew, demilitarize, see what happens next. A thriving Gaza, which you remember we all wanted in 2005 when Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, the Bush administration, Israel, Egypt, everybody was hoping, show us what a Palestinian state looks like. Okay, you have, you, you, you have your area. It's under your control. You have autonomy. Show us what a Palestinian state looks like. You know what happened within a few days of Israel pulling out of Gaza? Rockets began to fly. Within a few days of Israel pulling out of Gaza. If anybody says that to you, go back to the moment that Israel pulled out of Gaza and what happened within a week. Bring that to them and ask them, when Israel pulled out of Gaza, why did you shoot rockets? They will say, well, because Israel still controlled the borders. For good reason. Give them a little while to build some trust, to realize you're not going to be attacking them. Did Gaza give anybody in the world a chance to breathe and say, okay, Gaza, you know, we're going we're gonna to let go. Don't hit me. You know, you know if you've ever seen grappling, you, you, someone says, okay, I'm done fighting. You, you kind of let go slowly. You know, you don't want to give them a chance for a sucker punch. The minute Israel relaxed the grip, they started shooting rockets. So, I, I, you know, I don't want to sound hard-hearted here. I, I, I like to look for responsibility on both sides. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that interdicting goods is pleasant, but there's a reason. There's a reason Egypt has a closed border. There's a reason that Israel has closed borders. There's reason that, there are reasons that Israel interdicts commodities that go into Gaza. Right? But it's not the fault of Israel. Israel is responding to an organization 
that has promised enduring terrorist war against Israeli civilians. Never forget that. 